Good afternoon, everybody. How is everybody doing? Woo Welcome to this presentation called Delightful Design with the Kano Model. My name is Jem Rosario. I am a user experience specialist with Analytical Engine Interactive. So if you were at my senior partner's presentation just a few hours ago, so Christine over there, we worked together, and I am her uh, user experience um, lackey, for lack of a better term. <laughs> Expert, okay. Very supportive, okay, as you can see. <laughs> so we are a user experience and, co and content strategy um, consultancy, and we work with mostly not-for-profit organizations as well as public organizations to deliver digital products that users love. And the slides are over here. Um, I tried checking this yesterday, and it looks like it's a, it goes to the right slide share account. Um, if there are any issues that you encounter, just feel free to let me know. But as far as um, and if there are any discrepancies that you're going to find between SlideShare and the one I'm going to show you today, they're mostly cosmetic, mostly font sizes and all that. But other than that, the meat and potatoes are down. They're all in. And please, please, please feel free to reach out to, with me via LinkedIn or Twitter. And let's definitely get the, uh, the hashtag thing going on because yesterday it trended already. And... I'd like to see that thing happen um, during this afternoon. My understanding is that it's WCTO. Or, yeah. So, but it's but it's nice to have the it's nice to have the year though as well. All right. So, ready to go? All right. Let's jump in. So, suppose that you were flying home for the holidays, okay? We're kind of about to do that in a week. And you arrived at the airport at this scene. It was packed, it was noisy with all the chatter, the atmosphere was also a bit tense because a handful of flights were just rumored to be delayed. And horror of horrors, the rumors are so rife that one of those flights happened to be your flight that's gonna be delayed. What would you feel if after checking in on the airport via Facebook or Twitter or Foursquare or whatever, one of the crew members of your flight suddenly comes rushing towards you and, and, uh, and stops you and says, and, it, and says these lines. Hi, I'm Jem from Porter Airlines. We've, you told us your Twitter that you were flying with us today, so we've got you a little surprise to wish you a happy, ho a, a, a happy holiday. Happy holiday, lovely holiday. Kind of interchangeable, but one's going a little bit two months from now, the other one's just what or whatever. How would you feel? How would you feel if just out of nowhere your airline crew member gives you a gift? Anybody? Well, we're getting to that later, but how would you? Hmm? Freaked out? Yep. Yep, kind of a valid concern these days, but. Jared, Generally, how would you feel? Appreciative. Appreciative, yep, yep. In general, you probably are going to feel odd. You're probably going to be surprised. You could be entertained. You could be amazed. You could be freaked out, for sure, for privacy reasons, okay, just putting it out there. But for the most part, you're going to feel delighted. You're going to have this a little bit of a warm and fuzzy feeling like, oh, it's not every day that my stewardess actually runs after me along the concourse and just says, hey, are, you, are you Christine McLeod? Are you Christine McLeod? Um, hi, I'm blah, 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 blah. It's, it doesn't usually happen, but, you know, it sort of happened in this alternate universe. This was what KLM did in 2010 when they launched KLM Surprise, a campaign where they went out surprising their customers with personalized gifts whenever they checked in via their social media platforms. So to give an example, if, for example, one of their riders for today was going to participate in the Boston Marathon, what they would probably do, what KLM would do when this campaign was on, was that they're going to research this runner's, um, this runner's social media activity and, and general profile, like, oh, where's she really going and all that. And they're going to try to give her, for example, a Nike Plus watch a fitness tracker app or something. Or for example, if there's a couple that's going on a vacation at, a, at New York City, 
they're probably going to try to come up with a, with a decent book on what are the best spots to go in New York during your holiday, during your honeymoon, and all that. This campaign was so successful that it garnered over 1 million impressions on Twitter alone. 1 million impressions, 1 million views on Twitter alone. And not only that, it got a Can Lions Award for public relations. Okay? What, let that sit in a little bit. 1 million views just on Twitter and a Can, Can Lions Award for public relations. I mean, it's one thing for ad agencies to fight it out for awards. Okay? It's one thing for the Ogilvy's, for the Saatchi and Saatchi, for the J. Walter Thompson's, for the publicists of the world to really just fight it out out there for ad, for ad awards. But if you get a Cannes Award, well, I think it's probably safe to say that you really have, must have done something really, really good. Just saying, okay? You probably have done something really, really good. For the longest time, however, designers and developers haven't really been talking about delivering delight to our users. Primarily because our concept of good, this good web design was just three words. Just don't suck, okay? <laughs> Okay? Just don't suck. Okay? And, you know, our design standards really just hinged on making sure that things were functional, that things were reliable and relatively usable. And for a very long time, that was the case. Web design was largely on survival mode, making sure that things don't suck, that things don't break, and that it gets the job done. Full stop, end of story. I mean, look at that swirling at sign over there and all that. <laughs> Electrifyingtimes.com is part of BuzzFeed's 20 hilariously terrible corporate websites. And um, just, visit this, just visit this link over here and you probably could have a laugh trip yourself. I mean, just, just to put it out there, there was one major Ivy League university that kind of made the list. But, but that's really none of my business. <laughs> But things have changed. Hint, hint, Taylor Swift. <laughs> things have changed. The landscape has shifted from simply being on survival mode, where the goal is just don't suck, to deliberately creating and crafting delight. Okay? No longer is it enough for us to just simply, you know, let's just make this thing work. And let's just make this a little bit reliable when we use it and, you know, relatively usable. We need to compete on the delightful front, on the, pleasure, on the pleasurable, on the remarkable aspect. So the question then is, how do we deliver such delight to our users? Is it all just a nebulous concept fit for the books? Or is there a way that we could start designing with delight in mind? The answer to that will come from a great Japanese professor named Dr. Noriaki Kano, hence the Kano model. So Dr. Kano believes that there are three types of product attributes that resonate with users every time they use a product. It was first published in 1984 in the Journal of the Japanese Society for Quality Control. And when I, dig, and when I did the research, like, oh my god, how am I supposed to read this? It is in full Japanese. Like, is there any English translation out there? Unfortunately, it's none. But a lot of studies have really came out of this, um, of this 1984 paper, the most important bits and pieces of which are what we're going to be looking at today. It has, been used, it has since been used as a framework to tease out, to, to determine what makes products go from good to great, and then to really, really great. So that's the general overview of the Kano model. What is it about and what it tries to tease out. So, on the y-axis, you have here the levels of user, of user satisfaction. You can either go in extreme disgust or dissatisfaction to total satisfaction, which is the light. On the x-axis, it's the level of product execution. How good was the feature done? Was it really done great? Was it really done crappy? Where does it rest in the spectrum? So this is the, the, uh, the x-axis the and y-axis at which the model will unfold. And let's begin with the first one, the first product attribute, which are your satisfiers. Satisfiers are your product's most explicitly stated and desired qualities. The more we provide these qualities or features in the coming product, the more satisfied our users will be. 
So as you can see, there is a straight linear relationship. The more we add on to improvements within the product, in general, the trend goes that the more satisfied our customers, our users will be. So how many of you have seen this GIF, the evolution of the desk? Okay. So I'm not sure if this is a viral GIF, but one thing for sure is that it started popping up in my, in my social media feed. But in general, the evolution of the desk, I mean, now that I think about it and now that I look about it, I'm not really sure if we should call it the evolution of the desk when most of the action is happening on the computer. Do you notice that? Sure, things get whittled away from the desk, but all of them are coming into the computer. Did you notice that? Okay. In general, the more you improve this computer's capabilities, like for example, if you pack in more memory, there are more disk space, more pixel perfection, etc., the happier your customers will be. We don't really get to the, oh my goodness, this is so cool point yet. We don't really get there yet. But you know that at some point with those incremental positive changes, you somehow know that the satisfaction levels went a little bit higher with those extra capabilities. Satisfiers then are those features that when steadily added enhance satisfaction and customer retention. They compel us to keep improving and improving so that we can satisfy our customers and stay in the market. Okay? If there is any scenario where the, where the saying, the more the merrier, actually fits, it's probably going to be in the satisfiers area. The more we improve, the happier our customers are going to be. So that's your satisfiers, the first product attribute. So far, so good? Let's now move on to the second, to the second attribute. It's your basic expectations. These are the table stakes in your product. Okay? They're not really going to satisfy much if you've added them. We just kind of assume that they're there, for instance. But take away those basic features, and all hell breaks loose. Okay? So if the joker was with us today, he'd probably say something like this. Add a basic feature, nobody notices. But take them all away, well, then everyone loses their minds. Okay? Everybody loses their minds, okay? Now here's a question. How would you feel if you went to an e-commerce website and there was no add to cart button, let alone the price? Okay? E-commerce website, you want to buy something, but then there was no add to cart button and there was no price in there. It was just simply the thing over. It was just simply the clothing over there. What would you feel? Irritated. Irritated? What else? Annoyed. Annoyed? Confused? Well, guess what? It happened. Okay? It happened. Okay? So here's a story. You know, one day I woke up and I said, you know what? I wanted to channel my inner Chris Froome. I wanted to look like the guys that were fighting it out in the Tour de France and have a full cycling kit from top to bottom. I just want to wear something so cool like that and hop on my bike and pretend like, yeah, I'm fighting it out in the Alpe d'Huez and all that, and I want to get the yellow jersey, etc. So, sure, there's no such thing as Team Sky over here, but there was Trek Factory Racing. So I went on to Trek Factory Racing's website, and I went to the Toronto... Uh, the Toronto um, Toronto on uh, Aurora and Barry um, e-commerce site. And I did find what I was looking for, okay? I did find what I was looking for. The facets were there, the breadcrumbs were there, etc. I did get the replica jersey, what people like Fabian Cancellara and, and the rest were really wearing in, in the recent Tour de France. But the problem is, I don't know how much it is. I also don't know how am I gonna buy this, okay? So, What's a little guy like me to do? Then, like, like, what now? Like, what am I going to do now? Okay? I mean, how am I supposed to realize my, my dreams of becoming almost like, a, almost like a pro cyclist when I can't even get this thing for myself? I can't even purchase it. Now, to be sure, I did, went, I did go to a Trek Toronto. Um, uh, the, the, the bicycle store, and I still got the price in there because in general, when you're going to buy cycling gear, you have to really try it for yourself. So I kind of know how expensive it is, okay? But the thing is, you know, when you're trying to do your preliminary research, 
you just if you kind of know that it's going to be expensive, you kind of want to know how expensive it's really going to be. You know, set up those expectations. The problem is it's not there. Okay? It's not there. The two basic features that I really, really want or what I come to expect, they're really not there. Okay? There could be business decisions to this, but really, at, for the most part, when we, when we think of e-commerce websites, we have those basic expectations. So what I'm trying to share with you with this little rant of sorts is that we really don't want to mess with basic expectations. Don't try to mess with them. Just imagine if you were going to go to any house here in North America and then there was no heater, okay? Or let alone if you were in Iqaluit and then there was no heater in the house or something. I mean, how are you gonna survive the winters? So that kind of basic expectations, you want to have them all pat down. You want to preserve them, you want to keep them or all else, or else all hell breaks loose. They won't necessarily push the satisfaction needle all the way to the delight bucket when added, but lose it and frustration is gonna kick in. So let's make sure that those features are in so that we can prevent our users from going all sad and all mopey and all kinds of things, okay? So that's feature number two. We now go to the third. We now come to the delighters. These are the attractive features that bring on the wow factor in your product and make it memorable in the process, okay? So these are the really, really cool stuff that we want to target for. Now, some examples of it are probably some of, the, some of the applications that we're very familiar with. How many of you use Slack? Okay. So notice, notice how Slack tends to have a very cool visual design and a very crisp and flat, uh, flat interface and all that. And did you ever notice the greetings that it tells you? Okay. Like, like, like what, what's one? Sometimes you chase the bear or sometimes, or sometimes you eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you, something like that. Those kinds of, those kinds of, little, those kinds of little messages that, that, that's, that micro copy, it tends to add to the delightful experience. It doesn't necessarily mean too much if they're away, but you know that, but you know that if they're there, it just brings on the, the happiness factor, so to speak. Balsamic, on the other hand, it's a wireframing tool. And what's really cool about Balsamic is that their help items were made with a UX designer in mind. So for example, if I'm pouring away at those, at those wireframes that my client is not, probably not gonna look at, okay? <laughs> it will tell me something like, oh, Jem, do you know what you're gonna be cooking for dinner? Here's a suggestion for that, okay? Do you want background music to play? We can, we can enable that and then do you need some design inspiration? Are you hitting a roadblock? Like, can't you just put something in there on that canvas? Here, here are some things to look at so that your design inspiration is, is gonna kick in so that you can start building things, um, building things with, uh, with, uh, with the interface and all that, okay? Now, it is very important to understand that the lighters are cool, nice to haves. If they're there, it's great. If not, we can live with it, okay? It's not like there's gonna be a delight apocalypse if the lighters were somewhat forgotten in the product, okay? We, it's, we're relatively gonna be fine, okay? We're relatively gonna be fine. What you'll find, however, is that the lighters are often the fodder for differentiation and innovation, okay? They will set the tone for the competitive landscape of that very product and what future versions must achieve in order to stay competitive and relevant. So pay attention to these features, okay? Because once those delighters have really permeated the business landscape, if those cool things have really become the in thing, the next iterations of that very product will really, will really say, oh yeah, for example, this company has really done this really cool thing. We need to make sure that that thing is also in our product or else we're gonna be taken out of the, uh, taken out of the competition. It's one of the ways to stay relevant and competitive. Because for all you know, your next millionaire project might just be there, okay? So those are the three Kano attributes. You have your exciters and your delighters, the satisfiers, and then your basic expectations. So that's in general is the overview of the Kano model. So the next question then is, so how do we use it? How do we use this Kano model so that we could actually get, in, get, it, uh, get it working for our clients and for our organizations? There is a formal and an informal way of doing it. 
So I'm going to present to you the formal ways first before we go on to the uh, before we go on to the uh, the informal methods that we and that Christine and I have really um have really leveraged in order to bring on the delight to our uh, to our to our projects. So it's a three-step process for the formal process. The first one is to ask the Kano question pair. Ask the Ano question pair. So for example, given a short list of features to develop or analyze, we ask a pair of questions from our users. So it's two forms, the functional and the dysfunctional form. The functional form is the positive phrasing of that question. Like, for example, how would you feel if, product, if the product had feature X? Okay? Positive form. Okay? Functional form, positive form. You also have to ask the opposite side, the negation of it, which is how would you feel if the product did not have this kind of feature? So that's your dysfunctional form. They always have to go together. So we, ask, so we ask that, the functional and the dysfunctional form. We're basically assessing how users are going to feel if this feature were somehow present or not. So to put it in a little bit of a realistic setting, how would you feel okay, if elections.ca had a Find My Polling Station tool or service? Here's a fun fact, ladies and gentlemen. When you go to Elections Canada's website today, you can find your writing for sure. Put in your postal code, you will find it. But there is no way for you to find where you're going to vote. Okay? There is no way for you to find out how you're going to vote. Okay? So, I mean, I just, got my, I just got my voter's information card uh, last week. And I said, oh, cool, it's finally here. I know, I know now where to vote. It's just a stone's throw away from my house. But then I immediately thought, oh, my. What if I'm actually going to change my mind? and vote a little bit earlier. So where am I actually going to go? What if I need that information like in, the, in, just, in just a, you know, like just out of nowhere, and then I don't have the voter's card with me? There's no way for me to know because Elections Canada hasn't really put it in there. So let's say, for instance, that we're going to be working for them and we're going to try to build this thing for them, the Find My Polling Station tool or service. So we ask the functional and the dysfunctional form of the question, and then we come up with those five answers. How would you feel? Would you like it? Would you expect it? Are you going to be neutral about it? Can you live with it? Or will you dislike it? Okay. So these five responses are going to be very critical. And then, of course, you put your, you put your answers over there. Now, just a, just a little bit of a fun fact over here. When I learned that Elections Canada didn't have a Find My Polling Station feature, I was initially really, really irritated. Like, why? But then eventually, I just came back to my senses and, and said, OK, fine. I probably could live with it. It only just gives me my, my, my riding anyway, for as long as I know where I'm going to vote. And so it's going to be fine. But guess what? I was actually settling for second best. So it kind of feels like I'm just living with it. So hence that, so hence that answer over there. So now that we've had those, um, now that we have those, um, uh, those, uh, those, uh, those responses, we're going to be analyzing them and plot them to this table. By the way, this one is a very important table. Like We need to keep this format. We need to keep this format intact. The dysfunctional question has to go at the top, and the functional question has to go to the side. Okay? We, just have to, we just have to take care of that, because um, the responses over here are really dependent on the, on, uh, the analysis. The final analysis is going to depend on the positioning of the dysfunctional and the, func and the functional questions. So, so we've had already our answers. Okay? We already have our answers. So if we're going to transpose it, so for example, the find my polling station elections.ca is not available. If it's available, I said that I can live with it if it's not available. And I said that I will definitely like it if it's available. Plot those two together, and we have an exciter. We have an exciter. So that's, so that's the formal way of using the Kano model. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the very involved way at which we could apply it. And then once we've done that analysis, we're just going to do, do a tally of how many, how many exciters did we really have, how many linear, linear one-dimensional satisfiers did we have, any must-haves, and all the rest. Then we tally them, and then we just identify this feature is actually an exciter. So that's, so that's your formal analysis. So that's your three steps. Are we doing good so far? Yeah. We're kind of just 
powering through this because I want to be able to cover as much ground as possible. Yes? That last table, maybe I'm on my own here, but I found it a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. All these letters and the indifferent reverse questionable. Okay. So um, the indifferent, the indifferent um, quality. So, so that's a good question. When we say it's an indifferent quality, okay, it feel, it's like if they're there, doesn't really bother me if they're there or not. So you're kind of indifferent. You don't, what you really want to pay attention to, however, are the M's, the L's, and the E's. Reverse qualities, however, is like, don't add this feature ever. Okay? If you do, like, it's, not just a, it's, it's, not just a, it's, it's not just like you completely dissatisfied the user, but it's like a total fail, so to speak. Now, the questionable is more, uh, more those like, did the user actually know? what the right response to this is. So um, these are more the, uh, the second level or the more advanced features. What you're really more interested in is the M's and the L's and the E's. Does that, does that answer the question? OK. So there we've, um, we've uh, identified, tallied all the responses so that we know that the Find My Polling Station will be an eventual exciter. Now, here's the thing, though. The problem is, this thing just feels too involved, okay? Notice the steps that were involved. It's just like, oh my, not only do I have to ask people, not only do I have to go out of the, go out of the room or something, but I also have to do some statistical analysis, like what on earth is this model here? And then suddenly the litany of excuses are going to kick in, like, I don't have that time, user research is expensive, the product is simple enough to not warrant user research. I just want it to work like how Google and Facebook does, okay? <laughs> okay? And you know how to do that, right? You're the expert in here, right? And, you know, we really have bigger problems to deal with than what users want, okay? We're too busy for this sort of work. And they're, you, and they're stupid anyway. Like, why do you even need their input or something? I don't want to beat the dead horse here, okay? But every time I hear the, the litany of the excuses, I call it the litany of the excuses, really. So my very, very religious upbringing is really showing in here. It really doesn't feel any better. It really doesn't feel any better. And you know, Brian Rothstein says that if you publish bad content, you're, you're, you're basically killing a puppy or something. <laughs> it almost feels like that. Like, I'm not going to say that you're running a pet cemetery or something, but I would, I would say that you know, you're not just running a pet cemetery. You're essentially burying your user experience designer down to the, down to the grave when you say that I, I, don't, I, I don't need to go through all this process. Like, it's so simple enough. Like, why don't you just figure it out? Okay? But the thing is, you know, there's some kind of a truth to it, okay? The formal process really kind of feels very involved. And part of the problem really with the Kano model is that it's a survey, for heaven's sake. It's a survey. Not only do you have to screen your participants, not only do you have to gather them all, make sure that you have a $25 Freshco card to, to give at, at the end of the survey, but you also have to do the math. And you know, Christine is a math ma is, is, Christine was a math major, and I think she's going to be very happy with statistical analysis. But for me, who almost, almost failed math when I, was in, when I was in school, like, oh my god, no, 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 please, no, and all that. And I think you're going to agree with me that, well, do I really have to go through all of this, through all of this thing? So let's just put this in perspective, okay? just to really, really drive home the point. So suppose that you have 15 respondents. And it's the love bot, by the way. 15 responses, one survey equals 10 questions, and one question equals two answers. Do the math, and what you're going to find in here is that one, is that you will have to work with 150 questions to analyze. And at the end, you will have to analyze some 300 responses. And I should mention to you that 15 respondents, that's still kind of a conservative count. There are a lot of resources that would tell you that, no, 15 is just way too low. You actually have to go for 20. You have to go for 30, the more, the merrier. Now, now that we know that it's 300, I don't know about you, but if, but if you're going to be faced with this kind of number, it's just going to feel like, 
okay? You're just gonna be so mad, like, wh why? Like, I, I don't get it, okay? The good news, however, is that it doesn't have to feel that way. It doesn't have to feel that way. So we've looked at the formal process, that three-step functional, dysfunctional, the mapping, on the, ta the mapping on the table, and then the tallying. But now we're going to give you the three ways that we at Analytical Engine has, have used the Kano model to really be beneficial to us. Three ways that which the Kano model can help you really deliver amazing products for your users, for your customers, or how it has helped do our jobs better. So let's begin with the first one. Let us build a, feature, a working feature list, okay? So this is your chance to be very, very aspirational. This is your chance to be very aspirational. When you come into a meeting, you just say, okay, we have this really cool project. Um, what really do we want to see in this project eventually? What are our desired features? What are the functionalities that we really just want to have in this product? Let's be all aspirational during the first meeting. Don't think about architectural or development costs just yet. Just, just put it out there and let everybody just have a say as to what the, fi well, as to what the final product could be. Okay? This is your chance to be very aspirational. So, don't, so just, just hold back on the, uh, but this is going to be hard kind of thing. That can come later, but let's just be very aspirational over here. As you refine this list internally or with your users, you will find that the list, this feature list, slowly whittles down into a smaller set of features, but make no mistake, they are really, really vetted features. Okay? So from a big one, they're going to come down to something smaller, but very much well vetted. Does that sound good? Okay. The second, as you've identified that, let's now look outside. What's your competition doing? Okay? Have they tackled a similar problem before? Have they tackled a similar problem before? How did they solve this kind of business or design problem? What were their own exciters, satisfiers, and basic features? How is it performing in the market? Once you have that, you can come back to the features list and then cross out any features that may be bad news to you based from your competitor's successes or failures. So here's one example of how we really have, um, have, uh, have used it. So one of my favorite episodes with Christine is when we are just going to say, OK, we're going to build this thing for our client. So let's just print all the things, do all the screenshots, mobile and desktop, and just, you know, in that, in that, in that room, let's just go crazy on all the, on all the printing of the, of, the, of the websites and the mobile apps. And we're just going to put it in here, 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 here. So for example, if we're, do if we're doing a new site, we're going to look at CNN, we're going to look at Global, we're going to look at the BBC and all that. We're just going to do a lot of screenshots and it's just going to be like a huge gallery of, um, of uh, screenshots in our room. And that's our form of competitive analysis such that we just say, hey, this, one, this thing is good, this thing isn't really good. And then apart from that, we also try to break the interface every, one, every so often. We just wanted to know what really works and what really doesn't work and what might actually help us in the process. So we have an idea of what we want to build. But then what we're going to do is to take that step further and say, OK, so this is what others are doing. Is it actually in line with what we want to achieve in the process? So once you have that, come back to your feature list and then cross out any features that may be bad news to you based from your competitor's successes or failures. So that's the step, the second step. Look outside, check what they're doing, and eliminate or add accordingly. And the last one is, now that you've had that, start the prioritization process. Okay? Use your best judgment now on which features are exciters, satisfiers, and basic expectations. Okay? This is where you will now have to take into consideration. Okay, so we have this exciter over here. And it's really great, but you know, this thing is actually going to cost a lot. This is actually going to cost a lot. This is actually going to trigger some security issues or something. At the third step, when you're now starting to prioritize the feature list, the presupposition is that 
much of the whittling down has really happened already and now you're now you're, you're at the final stages of the uh, the prioritization and then you're just going to start really looking at the practical aspects is this going to be is google, is google going to penalize me for uh, for uh, having this kind of feature or something is are my developers gonna 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 like this kind of feature? Will it be easy to build? Will it not be easy to build? Is it gonna be is it gonna be feasible from the back end? Those kinds of things. This is where you now have to take on the 360 view, not just from the user's perspective, but also now from what you can handle from a technical perspective. Can you actually build it? Okay. And as much as possible, whenever possible, in every stage of the process, please, please, please back this up with user research. You can do it whether it is a Kano survey or you can also go for user interviews. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, encourage the use of focus groups, but somehow it, uh, it really just has to happen every once in a while, but just don't do it frequently. Do also some secondary research. Just back this up with some actual user input because the last thing that you want to happen is to build a product that your users are eventually going to say, I don't really need that. Why did you even have that? Okay. And horror of horrors, if that was actually the most expensive feature to build and that your users are just going to say, why? Like, I don't have any need for that or something. So if we're going to put it in a, uh, if we're going to put it in a more pictorial form, so you have here the list of features being considered. It's a working feature list. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it starts big. And then the more, the more you discuss, the more you analyze, the more you do user research, the more you do stakeholder interviews and all that, that list is going to narrow down, 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 and down until you find that, OK, we now have a smaller set of, uh, we have now have a smaller set of qualities, of features that may go into development. But this is now really vetted. This is now really vetted. And then once you find that, you can now whip up the Kano model board and start writing on sticky notes and start moving stuff around, okay? Now, it is totally possible that you already have an idea of what exciters, delighters, and exciters, delighters, satisfiers, and basic expectations are going to be. But then you're also just saying, okay, goes here. Oh, no, probably not an exciter. Probably going to be here or something. You can move stuff around. The basic premise of the informal approach is that you're taking the Kano model as some kind of a fodder for discussion, okay? You're using it as some kind of a, okay, so now that Professor Kano has this idea, how is it going to help me? And we use that to just continually, continually, continually whittle down the features into something that we can work with and something that we can actually get behind with. Remember, resources are limited and users prefer simplicity. Okay. And I'd like to just share with you what Leah Bewley, one of my user experience heroes, said in her book, The User Experience Team of One. Users almost always prefer a simple product with fewer features executed extremely well over a feature bloated product with a lot of capabilities that are executed only marginally well. What you want to happen ultimately is to have a good product that has, you know, it has all its satisfiers and basic expectations pat down. But you're not heaping way too much of the exciters and delighters, lest you run the risk of really just overwhelming your users and facilitating what Jared Spool will call experience rot. Okay? So, so basically, it's nice to have those exciters and delighters, but there's also a caveat there. Just don't go overboard because you just want to have... You have, we want to have a product that really just have a very focused uh, functionality that solves problems that, and something that has a product market fit. Sounds good? Yeah. So to cap this presentation, the Kano model that we've just seen today, it helps us identify a product or a service's exciters, satisfiers, and basic expectations. These are the three things that we really want to take, care, to take into consideration when we're doing our initial discovery processes. And the formal application is that, that three-step process in which you have the functional and the dysfunctional question, and then the mapping of that on, a, on the table of responses and then tallying all of them. But the informal application, and this is what I would advocate for those who really just don't have um, the resources to do a formal analysis, let us use the Kano model as some, as, as some kind of a heuristic to just do a little bit of a, of a feature thinking 
and to do a little bit more strategizing. Have that model with you. Use it as a, use it as a discussion fodder to, so that your team, will be, your team will be working with something that, you know, that is vetted, something that will help you identify what will really push your product forward, and all that. Differentiation and innovation happen at the delighter level. They are gonna be, they're going to be the most important qualities that may set your product apart. And for what it's worth, it could definitely become the new normal and eventually the basic expectation. So despite the caveat that exciters shouldn't really be heaped on way too much in the product, you still want to pay attention to that because they might actually be the thing that sets your product apart. It's probably where your million dollar project is going to be. And lastly, customer needs change. My, what, my customer needs change. For example, I am an indoor cycling instructor okay? in, my, in, my, in my other life. I would have never thought that these days, the spin bikes right now have digital displays, that you can actually upload your data, your workout data to a, to a mobile app, and then it just does the analysis for me and all that. I mean, I just want to ride the bike, but then it has those exciting, exciting digital displays and all that. I never would have thought that it was just gonna come down to that. But guess what? Most of the indoor cycling bikes these days, they have that kind of display. So this is an example of the lighters really taking the lead in the differentiation and innovation. Pay attention to that. They might be the thing that really brings your product to, uh, to the competitive front. And with that said, Thank you very much. OK, I literally have four minutes. I was really, really worried that I'm not going to have time. But let's, uh, let's have a good discussion over here. Are there any questions that you'd like me to ask? Yep. So how widely, widely is this model being used in designing agencies? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I tried to track this uh, way before. I mean, Jared, Sp Jared Spool, the usability expert, has uh, started talking about this in 2012. So, my, 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 from my own, uh, from my own view, from from my own binoculars, it seems to me that as soon as Jared started talking about this in 2012, it has been a staple of much of his uh, of his keynote addresses. One of which has been delivered here in Toronto. So, um, I am very optimistic that the Kano model is is. It's, it's something that a lot of design agencies could be familiar with. Now, as to how they're actually using it is another matter, because I would presume it's more of an internal matter. But it's a, it's a model that has been in place. A lot of UX designers have been talking about it. And they say, oh, yeah, it, it actually works. It helps us do feature prioritization. And if you work in the corporate, uh, corporate landscape, especially in an agile environment, um, the Kano model is also used as a feature prioritization um, uh, mechanism on top of relative weighting and, and all that. But that's more agile speak. Uh, but, but in general, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework that has received more attention these days than it has ever probably in the 1980s. Just one quick yep. follow-up. Are there any other models that's popular among designers? Mm. Pop, uh, models I mean, that are popular among say com competitors to this model or other alternatives people use in their design workflow. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, there, are, I whenever I look at whenever I look at uh, whenever I look at um, some of these design models, like one could one could be uh, one could be. I will have to think about. I will have to think about it. But um, but, but in general, in general, there are so many models these days. There are really there are really a lot of them, yeah. and um, and the challenge really is just to was just to filter out the noise as to what really works or not. But um, then but what's really interesting about the Akano model is that it has been sort of vetted by one of our industry leaders, okay. by one of our legends, so to speak, and and so that's why we say, oh, okay, it's because it's probably good. Yeah. <laughs> There's also the thing called the KJ technique or something, but there are a lot of uh, models out there, and we just have to just come down there and test it for ourselves. Anything else? Nothing more? Oh, yes? So assuming you've done your Kano model and done all that testing, um, what do you recommend to a client who wants to be very serious? So it seems to me like a lot of the delight examples that you gave in the beginning are 
not tongue in cheek necessarily, but they're they're light. Mm -hmm. How would you, do you ever, have you ever had a client who was like, oh no, no we're going too serious to offer these kinds of things? Um. I don't think we've had that kind of um, that kind of client, but um, but I would say that um, in general, whenever you have user input really presented to your client, and they tell and and if you t if you told them like yeah, these are what your users are really saying, and these are the things that they actually want, so to speak. In more in very in very many ways, I find that our clients have really been responsive. To that kind of uh, to that kind of feedback. Now that said, I do recognize that there are organizations that are say, no, our culture just doesn't just doesn't allow for these kinds of a very very happy and remarkable kind of uh, features. But you know, it's it's also a matter of just really onboarding your client right from the get go as well, like making sure that it's not just you manning the ship in the user research um, front and just you know just completely not being cognizant of what their needs and their culture is but you also have to constantly check in with them like okay this is what this is what we're seeing right now okay what do you think and just get them on board in the process so that there are no surprises that are happening does that answer your question I think so. okay I have an example actually okay um, just um, because one of our clients was a hospital and one of the features you think it would be basic expectation, but it, they they hid their phone number and the location of their emergency room deeply. It was deeply hidden on the website because they had this weird attitude of like, well, not this hospital isn't for everyone for a variety of reasons I won't go into. It would then reveal the identity of the client. So the delighter that we suggested was put the phone number and the address of the emergency room up on the home page and on every. So it wasn't a whimsical, it wasn't whimsical, but it was a feature that would... I would actually say that it was very urgent. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe... Wait, which which can definitely go on the... They're not always whimsical, I guess, yeah. is my point. Okay. Sometimes they're features that... Might actually be the thing that you're waiting for. Just being effortless. <laughs> effortless experience is the lie. Yeah. And I would say, actually, there's a really great book called The Effortless Experience by uh, Matthew Dixon. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic book. Um, sort of posits that um, essentially customer delight is not correlated with the lifetime value of a customer. Mm -hmm. And that's been proven by data with tickets and things. That the true thing is if you make an experience effortless, mm -hmm. customers will come back every day. We don't use MailChimp because we have the funny little monkey who tells you, like, yeah, good job. No, it's because email automation, which is something very complex, was made very easy by that. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Dana, Chis Dana Chisnell will actually back that up with, with her idea of delight as being composed of pleasure, flow, and meaning. Mm. So, uh, so that kind of very effortless and seamless thing, like especially in a world where we just want this to be really, really effortless, delivering something that's, that's not going to be too onerous is going to be a good thing. Yes? Certainly don't mean any disrespect at all to Dr. Keogh because mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with his um, with his work, but I'm going to look him up. My comment has to do more with the neutral um, category mm -hmm. that he suggests. In polling circles, for those of you who have done polling, or you can actually use this also for Mailchimp for surveys uh, or other products. Most scales used by professional pollsters have a even number scale, not an odd number scale. Because when you really think about it, that neutral is, is the shoulders, the, the shoulders drawn. You, mm. you don't care. It doesn't really tell you that much. Mm -hmm. So that's why pollsters, when they're calling you on the phone, or you're on question 157, and they promised it was only going to take three minutes out of your life. <laughs> Which okay. never really so happens. <laughs> what, what happens is, over, the longer that survey drags on, whether you're filling it out, people say, well, I don't really give a shit. You know, let's mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. you know, I want mm -hmm. this thing to be over. And you will find over time that people hit that neutral number, which doesn't help you in yeah. any way as a developer. Yeah. So um, that's, a, that's, that's a very important observation regarding, the, uh, regarding the, the, the neutral thing. I mean, I don't have a very clever answer to that, except that it's going to be one of those things that, um, that uh, the good doctor, Dr. Kano, just has to really factor in again. Like, like, think about it. It's it, it's it's this is basically a thirty-one-year-old 
analytical framework. And and um, I, I I personally feel that it's time to really revisit that and see if it really works up until this day, because for what it's worth, really that that kind of uh, that kind of it, that degradation of the, the into the neutral into the neutral um, space it just speaks a lot about like then if a lot of people are saying that they're just neutral about it then what's the use of this survey? Yes, the, the neutral point is attractive. Mm -hmm. That's why even, it's even better to say I'm either mildly delighted or mildly annoyed. Mm -hmm. But then you have to make the judgment call. What are you going to do about it? Is mm -hmm. that really worth your resources? So I think he's got the, the, the basic run uh, at the run at the top, mm -hmm. right? But the neutral ground is always toss yeah. that one out. Mm -hmm. Okay, two fifty. I definitely want to be uh, to uh, to reach out to you if you have any questions. But other than that, thank you so much for your uh, your participation today. Let's connect via LinkedIn or Twitter, and let's continue the conversation on the way out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.